Okay, so what I want to do is I want to walk everyone through the Ethereum virtual machine. So when we're going to, what we're going to do is I'm going to walk you through a diagram that depicts basically a transactional flow and the lifespan of a transaction as it goes through this Ethereum virtual machine. And it should give you a better understanding of actually what's going on and how we get basically truth in transactions and how we get that Turing complete computer uh, through transactions within Ethereum. So let's go ahead and get started. So what I've got here is I've got basically this diagram that depicts the entire Ethereum virtual machine. So let's go ahead and kind of talk about what it is that we're looking at here. So here at the top, if we look at this top section, this of course is going to be our actual blockchain. So this is the blockchain itself, right? And so um, this is basically, so what we're looking at here is again, just the blockchain itself. So this is basically um, just a representation of the actual blockchain that we have running on our systems. Uh, if we are running a peer-to-peer -peer node. And so if we have a peer-to-peer -peer node, we have uh, basically a level DB database that's holding this information within that particular database. And so um, each, each one of the blocks within that database is going to hold a block number which will have account state information and block header information. So let's go ahead and speak to all of these variables. So when we think about the block number, this is going to be representative of the block height that we're at. So uh, for instance, if we're at block 600,000, then that would be the actual block number that we would use to go find the transactions that are held within that block. So of course, inside of that block, it will have a code hash. Uh, a balance for uh, any accounts uh, and any account state changes. Uh, it'll have the root hash and also the nonce for the block, much like what we would find in a block nonce in a Bitcoin or any other proof of work uh, system that would be required for the not miner to come up with that block nonce in order for that block to be valid. All right. Um, that is also going to have a block header in each block. In the block header, it defines the block number that we're looking at, so an index of all the data that we're looking at. Uh, the bloom filter, which is basically a, a storage log of everything that's going on with the transactions there. Um, the parent hash, uh, or the hash of the parent block, or the block that preceded this particular block. Uh, and of course, that's what creates the chain of data. Uh, we have the gas limit, so the maximum amount of gas that can be spent on all transactions that are uh, within this particular block. The difficulty, uh, the mix hash, and the nonce, which is in essence the information that's provided about the mining information for when this particular block was mined. All of this information is in essence going to be held on every peer. Uh, as part of the blockchain ledger. That, of course, maintains the world state of all of those accounts. Those are maintained based on the address of that account. And then, of course, then that would actually have the state of the account after that. The um, Ethereum virtual machine uh, global namespace would be basically our global variables that we talk about. So things like message.sender and then the value of the message that that sender has sent uh, after it's been compiled down to EVM bytecode and serialized. That would be the values, the kind of what we're talking about. Um, so those, of course, are maintained on every single peer or every miner that we have in an Ethereum um, system. So every miner is going to have a copy of this ledger with all this information that maintains the state information about transactions, including smart contracts. So when we look at the Ethereum virtual machine, which would be the interpreter of transaction request, that's what we kind of see here. So if we kind of, let's just go ahead and just kind of draw us a little block here, but that's what this, um, this, oops, yeah, that's what this is representing. Uh, 
here. So that, and we'll make that a little bit bigger. So that, as we said before, is again, this is going to represent our EVM uh, execution model or um, the, uh, the um, interpreter. And so that's also, of course, what we see here in the diagram. And so when we look at that interpreter, this is what's running on every peer. So each peer node will be running this execution model. Uh, they will then get requests that come in. So this is what's happening over here from this transaction caller. So this means that someone that has an account within Ethereum is sending in a transaction. Now this transaction could come from an account that might represent an actual smart contract, or it could from a come, come from an account that's an externally owned account. So an externally owned account would be an account that's just an external wallet that's submitting the transaction, and a contract is a is an is a um, is a transaction that is uh, that is actually a, in a con from a from a contract address. So. Um, so anyway, those are the two different types of accounts that we have. And so when we have a transaction that's being instantiated, that transaction is going to come from an externally owned account or what we call it is an EOA. All right, so the um, transaction caller as part of that transaction request. Um, and so let's just kind of go down through the list here. Uh, first, we're going to see the init request, right? So the init is going to initialize the transaction. And so the initialization of this transaction information is going to have to know what information is being passed. And so the information that's being passed will be uh, submitted in what's called EVM bytecode. Now, the, basically what this is, is this is whatever your smart contract is, this is whatever your transaction request is, plus its signature, and all of the information that's required in order for that to be a well-formed transaction, which is what we're looking at here. Uh, all of that information will then come into the Ethereum virtual machine. So we're going to look at that here in just a second. And so as part of that, you're going to have the sign transaction uh, with the sender of that transaction, which is these VR and S variables, which will in essence allow the Ethereum virtual machine to ensure that the public address that is submitting this transaction with all of this information uh, was signed by the individual that owns the private keys uh, of that public address. And so that's where this signed transaction comes into play. Uh, then we have the information that uh, needs to define where is the message being sent, uh, the, or what is the information uh, being sent is about the two information. So who is the message sender? Uh, what is the value of the message? Uh, what is the gas price? What is the gas limit? And then lastly, we have this thing in, and so the gas price and the gas limit, let's just go ahead and talk about those. We'll talk about those real quick. Um, is basically just defining the ability for this Ethereum virtual machine because remember one thing about this Ethereum virtual machine and this is the execution model is this is a what we would consider a global singleton computing machine right with a shared ledger of data and so with, with that being said, this global singleton computing machine uh, with a shared ledger of data, which is this EVM, uh, that's the computing piece. The EVM is the computing piece. And so this EVM, we want to ensure that we don't have denial of service attacks where a transaction caller could submit a transaction that could run forever or have infinite loops in it. And so to prevent that from happening, uh, we charge a amount of gas. And so that's what we see here. Gas uh, is defined based on the price of how much will it cost to do the compute 
for the peer node that is running the Ethereum virtual machine. And so the node itself or the miner sets the price that they are willing to accept to perform those computing operations. That's the gas price. The gas limit would be how much gas could be spent or what's the maximum amount of gas that can be spent on this particular transaction. Uh, the transaction caller is the one that purchases the gas based on the price at the time and they use, of course, Ethereum to purchase the gas for the transaction. Any gas that's not used is returned back to the transaction caller in the event that the transaction completes and there's extra gas left over. In the event that there is no gas and there is additional transaction calls that need to be made to complete the transaction, the transaction would then revert because we have atomic transactions. If the entire transaction does not complete to uh, its fulfillment, then it will revert back to its beginning. And the gas that was used will not go back to the transaction caller. It will be used and, and, and used up by the miner. And so that's something to keep in mind that's a little bit different in Ethereum. All right. One last thing that's very much different in Ethereum, and this is this thing here that we see called the nonce. So let's go ahead and speak to that real quickly. The nonce, the nonce as a transaction caller would be the nonce of the externally owned account that is providing the transaction request. The nonce is an incremental counter that counts incrementally from that account how many transactions have occurred. It's in, ex, in essence giving us the ability to order the transactions as they've been requested from that particular account so that we have a good order of precedence of when transactions should occur so that we don't have a double spin problem with those transactions. And so that's why we have a transaction nonce in Ethereum. And so that's something that's somewhat different than what you have in Bitcoin. Okay, so the request comes in to the miner or to the miner's Ethereum virtual machine, which is what we're looking at here. Now that Ethereum virtual machine could be subdivided down into a couple of pieces. The actual execution model, which is what we see here, and that's what we're going to walk through first. And then we also have the state machine cycle for the bytecode operations that had been sent in as part of the data set that came from the transaction caller. And so when that particular transaction caller sent in that particular request, it was received by the, uh, the, to the Ethereum virtual machine to go ahead and execute that transaction. And so what we see here is it receives that input. As part of that input, it looks at things like the execution state of that particular transaction account, uh, what its account state, the existing state of that account, uh, what is the gas, the block header, the transaction sender, what is the sender's, uh, you know, the, the message dot sender, the data that's being sent, uh, the, the value in the transaction, um, the owner of the code that's actually being executed, and then what is the byte code of the contract that needs to actually be executed. All of that information will be eventually stored into permanent storage. However, before we store that information into permanent storage, we have to do LIFO stack opcodes on the request that came in because we have to take some of those arguments and transaction arguments and run them through our program. And so that's where these argument requests and program counters come into play. So as part of that, you have this thing called the LIFO stack. LIFO stack stands for last in, first out. So in essence, basically just think about you're just stacking things on a stack and the last in is what you got to look at first in order to do anything, right? Because that's kind of basically how this works. And so these are going to do what we call pushes and pops. Uh, so I don't see a pop on here, but there's a, there's a, uh, there's op codes on here, like subtracting, adding, doing exponent, putting values onto the stack, 
And so in essence, think of it when, as in kind of when you're just doing mathematical calculations uh, with a, uh, an adding machine. Uh, in essence, it's very similar to that. And so it's what we call a last in, first out stack that's using these opcodes in order to figure out what to do. And so we're going to put a magnifying glass on that stack down here at the bottom. And so where did those that data come in from that stack? Well, it came from this serialized data bytecode that's part of the EVM request that's coming in from the transaction caller. All right, so the request comes in and it comes in down here into this thing called the state machine, right? So this is the state machine that actually has the bytecode opcodes that came in over here. So the state machine gets these opcode requests that come in. They come into this clearing storage house. What happens is at that point is they say, okay, what kind of fee does it cost or does it cost in order for me to run this opcode? If it doesn't, just ref there's no there's no gas. Just refund the gas. If there is, then go ahead and deduct the amount for that particular opcode. Then let's go ahead and run the operation because we've paid for it. And then was it executed successfully? If it wasn't executed successfully, then let's revert. If it was executed successfully, then look and see if there's any remaining opcodes to run. And if there is, then go ahead and run them. If there's not any remaining opcodes to run, uh, then then we'll go ahead and just uh, we'll go ahead and commit that com that that request. If there is additional opcodes to run. If there is additional opcodes to run, then we're going to have to go in and look at how much gas is available and the amount of gas that is available will be able to be deducted for the next opcode. And so that's where we're looking at the stack to see which opcode needs to run and then what values need to be pulled or pushed off of the stack. At that point, now we're ready to go ahead and put this into play. And so we're going to go ahead and just continue this operation until we've done all of the requests that have been in this data bytecode from the transaction caller. Once that's done, it will go ahead and commit that back to memory and then store that, of course, back onto the stack. Uh, and so this is in essence what's happening as each transaction comes into the Ethereum virtual machine. So hopefully that helps make sense of kind of what happens with transaction requests and also helps you to basically have a better understanding of the EVM. All right, thanks.